Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. So if I'm trying to build this relationship, they need to know that I'm somebody that's a great person to do business with because I do what I'm going to, what I say I'm going to do, and I'm great at getting information quickly. Yeah. From a sales point of view, you don't want that person to cool off, right? No, because time kills all deals. That's right. Hey, everybody, it's Scott. It's Wednesday, and it's the Pitchworks Podcast, and I'm bringing back an old favorite. A lot of you have told me about how much benefit you've gotten from having Lisa Davidson, the outsourced sales manager, on this fine program. Well, she's back and battered than ever. In here, we're going to talk about time management. I've said this a thousand times. Time is the most valuable resource you have access to, but I don't think you're necessarily always going to have good mentors and good uh, advice in terms of what the best practices are there. So we're going to try to give you a hand. Uh, Before we start talking about this, I am going to stick out my hand and ask you to put goodies in it. In this case, I'm asking for you to rate and review this fine program. Go into iTunes, click a star rating, accompany that star rating with some string of words which explains the star rating, and then click submit. It's going to be awesome. You're going to love it so much. I love it. It's It feels good. Um, Lisa Davidson, the outsourced sales manager, he's, she's based here in Pittsburgh and has been doing this uh, for all different kinds of businesses. I'll let her tell you about that. But um, I love having Lisa on the show. She gives a different perspective to my own and keeps me from having to talk to myself whenever we have these sort of skills workshop types of thoughts. Uh, you know, you shouldn't just hear one perspective. So Lisa Davidson, how long has it been since you were in here? It was sometime last year, but I'm so excited to be back. I realized today in the car, I'm a three-peater. You are a three-peater. But, I am. But, you know, I'm, I'm really glad to have you in. You're really good at saying and seeing things that I don't see because you, you've got a completely different perspective, and I think it helps people. I think you and I can disagree on some things because we come at things from different angles, and um, we've both already been successful, so there's no sort of like weird – you know, competition. You're like, oh, I had success doing this. I didn't even try that because it didn't occur to me. It's a nice conversation. So how you been? I'm super. You look super. Thank you. You look happy. I am happy. I'm, it's, it's been a while since you've been in, but we've been busy. Yeah. I was checking. I think the last time you were on was like episode like 26 or something like something that. Something like that. And this is 50 episodes later. I know. Congratulations. Well, I appreciate Congratulations. that. But even still, I feel like I've been remiss and we, we, we got to fix that. So this week... I think a lot of people feel guilty treating time as a valuable resource. And and let me set the stage for you, right? Um, When you set a meeting for half an hour, you get kind of a funny vibe from people. Like, why is it only half an hour? Now, the the answer can very easily be because we only need half an hour. That's right. But somehow or another, the fine folks at Microsoft, when they decided what the default Outlook setting was going to be, it was that meetings are an hour. So first question. How many of your meetings have ever actually needed to be an hour? Not a lot. Not a bunch. Not a lot. And I think when you set the stage, I mean, we go to we we talk about you know setting um, setting expectations yeah. with prospects and customers. And I think sometimes you really stun them when you say you only need a half hour, and you only needed a half hour. Yeah, it, and honestly, a half hour is a long, long time when you think about new concepts that you're you're introducing people to. So I'm going to give everybody whiplash and think about what's the longest YouTube video you would watch. Like you sit down and somebody goes, watch this. And you look at that little counter in the bottom right and it says 30 colon zero zero. And all of a sudden you're like, no, 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 no. Exactly. Exactly. And I have to tell you, I actually, it, it sometimes deters me yeah. from what I'm going to watch if I know it's not, if the topic isn't going to actually grab me and set me on fire. If it's 10 minutes, I freak out. A yeah, bit. sometimes. So it's weird though. Again, um, we tell people we're going to burn half an hour of their day and they get weird because it's not long enough in their, in their sort of, I don't know, habits that they've formed. You tell somebody that you need them to watch a 10 minute long YouTube video. It's like you ask them to convert to Satanism. Like it's <laughs> <laughs> so I want to, I want to sort of 
talk about how it is that people can can use the value of time, right? The resource that is time. Um, but I also do want to talk a little bit about why it is that they end up sort of feeling guilty and how to get out of that feeling, right? Um, so let's do this. Let's do the last thing first, which is, you know, in your history, do you send one hour as, oh, you know what? We forgot to properly plug you. I mean, I know we're going to do it in the intro, but let's do it properly. I just figured Lisa everybody David's, knew who I was. I do know who you are, but you know what? I mean, there has been some audience shift in the meantime. It's been almost a year. So Lisa Davidson, the outsourced sales manager in the house here in the Epicast studios. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have you sent out half hour sales like meeting or customer meeting requests with any regularity? Is that a normal thing for you? Yes. Okay. So you had to overcome this sort of trepidation people have about why is it a short meeting? Why is it only 30 minutes? What lines do you like to use when you're talking to people about the, the reason a meeting is of the length that it's of? I like to send not a hot and heavy agenda, but just bullet points. Yeah. Here's why I need 30 minutes. We're going to talk about A, B, C, and D. Done. And, and at anything this point, else. you're assuming that they want the meeting. So you're not talking about prospecting. You're talking about someone who has agreed to see you. Correct. And you're sending bullet points. And here's what I'm going to cover. And if there's anything else additional that you want to add, maybe we'll need more time. But here's what I've planned for our meeting. I really like that bit at the end where it's like, you know, if, if you want to add something, you still have control, right? Right, right. Because there is something, and I think, I think I'm hitting on it now. It's, it feels presumptuous to tell the other party how long a meeting should be without their input. So Correct. if you send somebody a two-hour meeting request, it would be equally sort of unexpected. Wait, why is this two hours? I can't give you two hours. That's right. That's right. And I think when when you lay out or, again, set that expectation of what you're going to cover, yeah. I think it shows respect. You know, it shows respect and it shows you're prepared. And nobody wants, what's the worst thing? A half hour can feel like a lifetime if you're sitting with somebody that's all over the map and isn't prepared. Or just trying to burn the time. And I seriously think a lot of times that's what they're trying to do. Well, we got an hour and I really don't want to go back to doing my paperwork. Well, yeah. And if you if you set it for an hour and you start to stretch, you're, you're adding in all the stuff you talked about first. Where did you go to high school? How are your kids? And there's a place for that, but that shouldn't be filler. That should be really quality, you know, relationship building time. That you mean. That's right. You really want to know. That's right. It's genuine. I asked genuine. you where you went to high school because I want to know because maybe I think I've seen you there. Not because you live in Pittsburgh and people seem to think that that's how you can tell the character of a person. That's exactly right. <laughs> oh, you're one of those dirt bags from Steel Valley? Well, I'll never <laughs> like you. <laughs> See, you've been out there with the, with the polite people for way too long. We had to bring you back. My journey started off, and you were there for a, you know a, a bit of the early bit where I didn't necessarily have an identity yet. I was I was out there trying to bring new customers in, but I didn't have the understanding of what their uh, schedule, like how cluttered, how difficult, how tumultuous they're. If you're if you're talking to somebody that can actually give you what you want, right? Who can approve the deal? Who can cut a check? Who can sign a contract? Um, it took me a long time before I got to the other side of the table and realized like what are these people are actually going through and, and how much I resent having that time wasted. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way, this show has actually taught me a lot about it too, because I think I've had a lot of people that wanted to have a meeting and then we sit down and they go, tell me what the Pitchworks podcast is. And I, I just can't help but feel like you could have, you could have looked at this, right? Like I had somebody ask me what channel we're on on television. Oh, it's podcast it's yes. right there in the name. Anyway, so we're going to hit them up with bullet points. We're going to tell them sort of what to expect, but leaving the door open so that they can twist and amend and change and whatnot to their liking. And then that way, if you needed an hour, you could change the meeting request or you could change the slot. That's cool. Um, these all, all the time though, it seems like when people send a request. A sales rep is out there. They're working their phone. They're working the email. They're trying to get a meeting. Um, it seems like the first meeting they ask for is 10 o'clock, right? Like, Hey, are you available on the 17th? Well, I am. How's 10 o'clock? 
and you've got this this hole now. You're like you created. It's like taking that long flat piece in Tetris and just jamming it anywhere. <laughs> So you've got a blank day in your calendar. What meeting time do you ask for first? Do you start at eight? Do you start at nine? Where do you where do you put your first meeting on an empty day? Well, for me, I I know I'm the best I can be first thing in the morning. So if I can get in a, to a decision maker's day when they're fresh too, yeah, the earlier the better is my philosophy. How about that? But you know this whole idea of, of your schedule as Tetris. Is kind of funny because the blocks should all fit together without a whole lot of extra leakage in between. Right? They should. You should, yeah. Especially if you're one of those people that's 100 percent out of the office, right? You don't have an office. You don't have a right. even a desk in the cubicle farm or the or in the bullpen. Um, so you start at eight. Let's assume they're all pretty short, right? Let's say all these are like 15 minute drives between each other. Um, you're eight o'clock. Let's say you schedule that to go to nine because it's a really substantive meeting. You're going to do a deep dive on. Um. The next request you get for that same day, okay? So you're talking to a completely different prospect. This prospect, has you're not talking to them because they're near this first one. You're talking to them because they're the next one to say yes. Do you schedule them right after? So you say, I have a meeting at 8, it goes till 9, I'll see you at 9.30. Or do you try to maybe come from the other end now and say, you want to try something in the afternoon? For me, again, I know that... um Preparation for me is really key. Yeah. So I like to have a little bit of time in between so I can kind of clear my head from that first hour meeting that I had. Yeah. Because chances are what I discussed in that one is going to have some to do's and I'm going to want to jot those down or even get them done if I can for, you know, from my send me this, I'm going to forward you this article, blah, blah, blah. Try to get those cleared and I might schedule the next one from maybe 10. So I've got time to clear some of that stuff so I don't get jammed up at the end of the day with all this stuff that needs to be gotten to or or passed on so that, again, I'm looking to the, my prospect, mm-hmm. I'm showing respect, and then I'm timely. So if I'm trying to build this relationship, they need to know that I'm somebody that's a great person to do business with because I do what, I'm gonna, what I say I'm going to do, and I'm great at getting information quickly. Yeah. From a sales point of view – you don't want that person to cool off, right? No, because time kills all deals. That's right. The fa- the longer you tell them that they can wait, the more they wonder whether or not this is even necessary. That's exactly right. Yeah. And had we had technology back when you were back back in the day. Back. So, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you don't have to get back to the office to your email or, you know, by the time I get back to the office, I can be pumping stuff out throughout the day. Yeah. I uh I like the one hour buffer also, because I think if you're going to start off first thing in the morning, morning is where people start to discover things, or at least they start to tell you about what they discovered, right? So in other words, like, okay, the, uh, yesterday ended at five, let's say for a lot of people, it's an eight to five day. They go home, they're eating Brussels sprouts with the family. And then all of a sudden the light bulb gets screwed in and they go, oh, that proposal didn't have the thing I wanted, or I forgot to tell Lisa that I needed. So you're going to get that email first thing the next morning when they're back in their office, when they're back, you know, sort of on track and they've got their to-do list open, you know, their little notebook opens up and it says the first thing in there is going to say from the night before, send an email and request a revision to that proposal. If you stack eight to nine and then you immediately jump into a nine o'clock and then you immediately jump into a 10 o'clock, you're not going to get back to that person. You're not going to see that email. You're not going to respond in a timely fashion if you just block them out and you make them wait for a day even, you know, a half a day in some cases. Uh, you know, you get to lunch and finally you're allowed to look at your emails. Um, so that's an interesting, you, that buffer zone being a little bit longer does give you the opportunity to be a little bit more nimble. If you're a sales manager and you look at that, do you like that, 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 keep jumping into your email in between meetings? I think so yeah. as a sales manager point of view, because again, you, you yeah, you're out there looking for new business, but you also got to take care of your existing too, because those folks are your bread and butter, you know? So you need to make sure there are no fires that need to be put out 
and again, being tending, tending your, your, your customers, taking good care of everybody. So it has to have a balance. It can't always be one sided out there pounding pavement. You just have to be out there balancing. It's a balancing act. See, I think there's a lot of like LinkedIn career development warriors out there that have these really beautiful and ornate concepts. They want to attack the schedule in a way that you've never seen before because they want to differentiate their, their thought process as a product. Right. Um, and they say something like, well, you know, make sure that you only check email twice a day. I've seen, I don't know about a, like an overabundance of this, but I have seen people sort of float this as, uh, email as time suck. And I get that. Like, uh, I'm not going to say it's, it's wrong, but I am going to say that your clients by and large, and I, I mean, you know me, I've worked on enterprise almost my entire career. Um, and, and they are largely disorganized and they request that more attentive response where you need to kind of check in between your meetings. Um, and that's why I asked about the sales manager's perspective. Cause I mean, you're, you're talking to that part, that person a little bit more often than I am at this point. I also like to put a caveat on, on that checking the email twice a day. Yeah. I think, I think it depends on, on your job title Mm -hmm. too, because I can see somebody that's, um, you know, maybe in a financial something or, or in a different industry rather than production side and sales side side, though. I think that's the differentiator. Yes. So I can understand if you're in the midst of a prod of a project, you deadlines can be delayed because you aren't concentrating. You're not giving concentrated chunks of time to, to the project and you are getting pulled away to email. So I think there's validity to that philosophy. Mm-hmm. However, I don't know that it fits that it fits a salesperson really well. I, I think there has to be a balance. I agree with that thought process. You know, I mean I, I, I think that if if you're someone who has to sit down and code the new product and you have to sell. And there's a bunch of those people in in the audience for the Pitchworks podcast. A lot of startups, you know, they turn to us and they're like, look, no one in this group has ever sold before. So how do we do it? And if that's who you are, I would say spend the morning on the product and spend the afternoon on sales. Give yourself four hours and four hours or something else where the, the two don't run into each other because when you're producing, you're, you're making the product or you're running a project or whatever, that uninterrupted thought is the secret sauce. You get into that flow state, right? In sales, ADD is a superpower. It is. It honestly is. It is a, it is a survival instinct. Yep. Um, where you have to develop this skill. And then, you know, I mean, I don't mean to make light of ADD, you know, but I mean, honestly, it is basically like the same thing I hear about those kids that have that diagnosis is what salespeople get rewarded for during the day. It's like, okay, well, you know that thing you were doing? Well, put it all down because your biggest customer is calling and if you don't pick up the phone, they're going to be offended and they're going to start looking for another vendor. Right. If time is the most important thing you've got or one of the most important things you've got, does it make sense to be on the road, shaking hands, kissing babies, being in the, in the client's office. And this is the bit where I say that condescending uniform thing. It's 2018, man, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think the old saying goes, people buy from people. Mm. And I, I don't think as much as we've gotten technologically driven, yes. I think that's still holds true. I think there's nothing that can take the place of to to build a relationship and to build value for a prospective vendor customer relationship than being face to face and and being in the room with that person and not to get all woo woo but kind of get their vibe, you know? Yeah. Cuz there are just some people, I got to tell you, after meeting them, I really don't want to do business with them because they feel kind of icky. Yeah, you know. No, I know this. I'm so, and this. you don't go always get the ick via Skype. You know. Right. Yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crazy eyes don't come across Skype yeah, as easy. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, and if you wouldn't mind, sort of tell us a little bit about who it is that you're working with. Again, you've been on the show a couple times, but just for the people that either don't remember or weren't here for that. Sure. Well. I'm a I'm a sales consultant is what I label myself. I really don't like that label. So if anybody has anything creative else they want to help me name myself. Oh, you can't I'm drop open. that. You know I'm going to come up with something. <laughs> God, I'm going to scratch at that like a scab. There you go. Just keep at I'm it. I'm just going to pick at that for the rest of the show. 
But I re- I work with um I work with small to medium sized businesses that some of them have sales teams and some of them the owner of the company is still selling. So again, it's kind of a a, mi- a mi- mismatch. Mix, yeah, you know, a it's mismatch. A mixed bag, yeah. yeah, but. B to C sometimes and B to B, right? Yeah. So that that further complicates the answer. That does right? d- does complicate the answer. But you're still saying so. If you were at the at the very low end, right? Like somebody is selling, I don't know, they're selling a hundred dollar thing, but they're selling a lot of them. Okay. Right? You're still saying face to face is better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and again, once you've established, you know, unless that end user or that person is comfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, doing the phone thing, or or you know, doing a video chat, or if the if to me the customer con- or the prospect customer right drives how you respond. I don't think there's a right answer for every for every every you know uh, cookie cutter. I think it's interesting though if there was a way for us to identify who it is those prospects that are happy doing things remotely because it is a get out of, get out of jail free card if you can do it again. <sighs> I always try to draw this back to money, right? If somebody walked up to you on the street right now and said, can I have a dollar? It is unlikely that you would say yes. Correct. Okay? Um, if somebody came up to you and said, can I talk to you for a minute? Maybe you would because we're sort of hardwired to believe that money is more valuable. But when you actually look at the resource allocation of your life, you can't buy more time. I think it'd be interesting to try to find people that are okay buying from a remote salesperson. I think if I could somehow screen them, all other things being equal, not disqualified by anything else, that'd be a really interesting piece of data to have. These This group here loves buying things from Skype web demos and that kind of thing. Uh, but we've got to tighten up on our use of our time. Mm-hmm. In your career, what was the arc for you in terms of how you managed time? Like in the early going, were you really loose with it? Yes. Yeah, so was I. Yeah. Well, think about it. it again, it's your perspective. And the perspective when we, we were in corporate sales, right. so all that mattered were numbers, right? The quality of the contact didn't matter. Just as long as you were banging on doors, coming back to the office with 25 cards a day, and set an appointment. Oh, I got a great one for you. So um, my father, Bill McTaggart, you know, who is no longer with us, but he had some great ones. He said, you know, this job was a lot better before they implemented management by index. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was a kid. I mean, I was not even to the point where I was, you know, like actually in the professional workforce. And I was just like, what do you mean by that? And he's like, oh, you know, somewhere along the line, somebody decided that there was a right number of meetings to have in a week. There was a right number of phone calls. There was a right number of everything. That's right. And they weren't really looking at the dollars or the profits or anything, but they were trying to look at everything. And it wasn't wasn't until later on that I realized why that was so problematic. And it's because if you are bringing whales into the boat, you're not passing out as many business cards. That's right. And it throws off all this management by index. That's exactly right. And I have to tell you, in, in my practice as a consultant, I get asked for that number almost on a daily basis. Advisor. Oh, there you go. Thank you. It I took like me it. a minute, but I got it. I that. like advisor. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Wow. But don't as worry, an I'm not done. As so an don't, advisor. Don't write it in ink yet. <laughs> I get asked the question, what's the right number? And I I don't ha- there isn't an answer right. because of exactly what you what you said to me. So let's say the way that you're getting your prospects, your potential customers in to your funnel or even just into your organization could be coming from a couple of different ways. So if you got somebody freezing cold coming in from the from the website that really is starting from scratch, yeah. but then you've gotten a referral from a customer, hey, guess what? One's going to need a lot less time to warm up and go through the process than the other. So that that negates the whole idea of the certain number. To me, it's the quality of the initial the initial um, contact. Yeah. How many schools have you seen that have a degree in sales? Oh, not, not many. Lot. No. And again, I could go off on this because this is a, a pet peeve of mine. 
where they link sales and marketing. Which are, yeah, I mean, that's, now you just stepped on one of mine, which is that marketing is like three different things. Yes. Right. There's the spreadsheet marketer. There's the creative marketer. Right. And then there's the person who is like the specialist, the adjunct to a team marketer. Yes. Um, that's where social media lives. That's where these video type companies come in. And they say they're in marketing because they are in marketing. But yeah. And then sales and marketing. What One brings you know, leads in at a higher velocity, but the other one actually has to bring in leads and close them. That's right. Uh, yeah. This, this whole thing, it amazes me to what extent it's been treated like it's radioactive by people who own and operate businesses of large scale. Mm -hmm. I understand if, uh, what was it? I saw that movie, The Founder, and I had to laugh. Did you see this movie where they, did not. they were talking about uh, basically the creation of the McDonald's franchise? Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Michael Keaton uh, plays Ray Kroc, and basically he happens upon a couple of brothers that started this thing called the Speedy System, which was, I mean, that was really what McDonald's did, and it was like, this is how fast you should go creating a million cheeseburgers for the window, right? Um when you're talking about something like that, marketing has done the sale, production is fairly standardized, every ticket is roughly the same size, and you don't sit there and try to talk somebody into a cheeseburger, okay, gotcha, 10-4, 100%, management by index, marketing leads the, leads the charge, you know what, let's do this. You start talking about like an engineered sale, right, okay, well, we're gonna in, in, you know, develop a back end for a very, you know, high availability web service that doesn't exist yet. No, no, there's just no such thing. There's no such thing as 10 business cards a week. And there's no such thing as 30 meetings, you know, a month or whatever it is. I don't know. You may disagree. No, I agree with you hundred percent. And again, it's because of that. Not, not all deals are equal, right? Not all prospects are equal, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, I've seen stratification where they say this is the large customer group, this is the middle customer group, this is the small customer. They're still they're all over the road. You know, when you and I first met, I think the company we were working for, I think, was expecting something like ten thousand dollars worth of monthly new monthly billings, something every month, like that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah, but that like sometimes a customer would come in that would do five times your quota with one contract, right? And there's a ton of hand holding in there. And it was like, well, hey, good news. I brought in $50,000 worth of recurring monthly revenue. Well, yeah. Well, your meetings are all out of whack, loser. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> when in doubt, whip the horses. There was a certain type of management in play in some That's places. That's exactly right. I honestly think a lot of those indexes are specifically designed to keep you from always, from ever getting a perfect, you know, uh, performance review or, you know, like coming out of anything smelling like a rose. Right? Oh, you crushed your numbers. Too bad you didn't get enough business cards. That's exactly right. I don't know. I hate that. Um, as far as time goes, this doesn't seem to be like a topic people like to talk about. I've noticed it. When we've talked about time management on the show in the past, people get an icky feeling about it. Do you, I mean, I don't understand why. Do you have any insight into why people are so bothered by time management? Well, I think because we're badgered with, Things that suck our time. Okay. I, I think, you know, and think about, you know, even how we consume um, information. Think about, you know, I, I can't tell you the last time I sat down and read a newspaper because I don't have the patience anymore to sit down and read a whole article. I am whipping through what I want to find, Google what I need to need to find, and I'm consuming things that are of interest to me or, or of my need. Yeah. So I think what's happened is, you know, things have gotten faster. Mm -hmm. And so that's caused us to have to respond to things faster because the expectation has been set. But don't you think there's also like a, a lower, whatever you want to call it, like a lower threshold for us to drop everything now too? Like we've we've trained ourselves to the point where we'll drop something important for something irrelevant. This stupid thing clicks to tell me I have a text message. And honestly, you'd think a car just came through the living room window. <laughs> Like, wait, oh my God, this could be really important. Um, oh, according to this, I have 10,000 more Amex points this month. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's something dumb. Exactly. So I think to answer your question, I think exactly that. We now feel the need to 
to manage all of this stuff. Yeah. And a, a philosophy that I had, there was a woman that was an accountant in one of my networking groups back in the day. And her tagline, at, whenever she, after she would do her commercial every week, would be, what you can measure, you can manage. Yeah. Love that. Super Love simple and that. easy to sign on with. But how do I do that? And I think that becomes the key because, of course, she's talking about finances, but I think it could be anything that we consider a commodity, right? Yeah. So for me, it's time. And I really think that it's prioritizing. So, and this was- How did we get this far into the into the show without saying that word? Well, I, I don't know. I suck. No, you don't. A little bit. No. Because I, yeah. I, I wasn't going to leave without talking about it, so- <laughs> no, you know what? I mean, it's it's my word too. I mean, I'm a big fan. Yeah, you got to prioritize. And and again, you know, how do you do that? And I think it's it's the set, deciding ahead of time what are the things that are important to you. So one of the things I talk to my clients about because you've got folks that are running companies and have to sell and are putting out the fires and have employees with issues and da 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 da. da, da. Well, how do I find time to sell? And I, you got to block it out. So if it's the first thing in the morning before you even turn an email on, make your five calls. Have it, you know, be prepared. Have your list for the week. Like I know this sounds elementary, no, but no, 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 no. But, I know you're right. But for you and I, I if mean, if you don't put it on the calendar, it doesn't happen. That's exactly right. And I even take it a step further where I color code. I color code my calendar. So at the end of the week, when I go, oh my gosh, what did I do this week? I can see, oh, well, okay. And and anything that's billable or anything that's going to make me money is green. Right. So I'm looking for how much green is in my week that week. And if I had a good week, cool. There are other weeks that are heavy with networking events or doing my doing um, meetings with my referral partners. Now, those are important too, because those are lead generators for me. But I have to keep the balance, right? So those are gold colored. So in a week, I can see. I even have my personal stuff. Yeah. You know, personal stuff is pink because I'm a girl. So oh, I have pink. you're not. Yes. So it's pink and pretty. You're a very professional woman. <laughs> you're a, that's right. That's right. And you're a hard case at that. The outsourced sales manager.com is yes. where you would find the website. And yes. it would be what? Just Lisa at? Lisa at the outsourced sales manager. Lisa Davidson, the outsourced sales manager. Thanks as always. <laughs> and that's the end of this week's Pitchworks. I hope you enjoyed it. It's always nice to have Lisa come back in. I've known Lisa a long time and she's a really valuable resource. Uh, if you are local or you plan to be in the area, you should hit her up. Uh, always useful having a soundboard just to tell you kind of what she thinks. And if, you know, if, if there's a way for you to work together, great. But uh, Lisa's been around. She, she understands the technology side, you know, and all the, the highfalutin stuff as well as the block and tackle things that make you money in real life too. Um, make sure you hit us up on social media. It's always Pitchworks, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S. Throw a dot com at the end if you want to see the website. I think you do. I think it's cool looking because I put a lot of time into it. And, uh, you know, this is like the one single-minded purpose I had in composing it. Uh, Buzzy and I are going to go back in the lab. We're going to make up another Pitchworks for you. It's going to be great. Thanks again for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe if you're not already. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit Pitchworks.com. E-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.com. On social media, Find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.